Hi everyone. Last episode, we formalized the idea of a vector space in quantum mechanics. We introduced KETs. Here's a quick recap of the information we need for this episode. We found that particle quantum states are represented by a ket vector in our vector space. We then found that for any physical quantity, our quantum state is in a linear combination of all possible outcome states for that particular quantity. Lastly, we found that this list of outcome states may be infinite. This is all the recap we need for this episode. Now, I want to ask a simple but very important question. We have a vector space of quantum states, but what is the dimension of this vector space? Remember that the dimension of a vector space is the number of vectors needed to form a basis. So, how big is a basis in this vector space? For a clue, we can remember that it is possible for a quantum state to be in an infinite linear combination of outcome states. We haven't proven that this list of outcome states forms a basis, but let's assume that they do. We'll prove this in a later episode. This means that we can have infinitely many vectors in our basis, and, therefore, our vector space can have infinite dimension. This may seem strange, but we need a notion of infinite dimension in order to use linear algebra to describe our particle. This seems fine and we can call it a day, but we always need to be very careful when we add infinities into our theory. To show us what can go wrong when we add infinities into linear algebra, let us look at a specific example of a vector space. Let us look at the vector space of polynomials over the real numbers. Remember from last episode that a set of objects constitutes a vector space if they satisfy the following rules. It's fairly straightforward to check that polynomials satisfy all of these. Seriously, pick any of these rules and plug in polynomials for u, v, and w, and real numbers for a and b. You'll see that it holds true. Hopefully this also shows you how things other than columns of numbers and arrows can act as a vector. It should also be clear that we have a very natural basis for this vector space. We can just take the set of all powers of x, starting with the zeroth power. Using this as a basis, any polynomial can be expressed as some linear combination of elements of this basis. Now let us examine what happens when we extend these linear combinations to infinity. Let us use our basis to construct an infinite linear combination with carefully chosen coefficients. The linear combination is shown on the left, and its graph is shown on the right. As we add more and more terms, you may notice that the function starts to look familiar. You might recognize that with infinitely many terms, we would have the Taylor series for e to the x. This should be a huge surprise, since e to the x is obviously not a polynomial. Therefore, we ended up with something completely outside of our vector space. I mean, just think about how crazy that is. Imagine we were collecting infinitely many rocks, always adding more rocks. Then suddenly, at the end of it, we get a slice of apple pie. It's just something completely different than what we started with. So, what actually went wrong? I think it's worth delving into the issue, since the problem that infinity introduces is actually a bit subtle. The answer boils down to the fact that infinity is a concept, not a number. For any finite linear combination, we do indeed have a polynomial and therefore a vector, no matter how big it is. But once we let the number of terms approach the idea of infinity, what we get in the limit is not a polynomial, and we are outside our vector space. I like to think of it in terms of this diagram, which shows regions of objects outside and inside our vector space. The first term in the linear combination gives us some element in our vector space. As we add more terms, we push the linear combination towards the edge of our vector space. And in the limit of infinite terms, we end up right on the edge of our vector space, barely outside it. I know it sounds like I'm belaboring this point, but it really is important that we understand why introducing infinity into a vector space is risky. So, what does this mean for our quantum vector space? 
Well, it means that if our quantum state is in an infinite superposition of outcome states, then there's a chance this quantum state is outside our vector space, and therefore not a quantum state at all. This is a huge problem. So how do we solve this problem? Well, this is our mathematical theory, so let's place an extra rule on our quantum vector space. A rule that says that every convergent sum of vectors must converge to an element inside our vector space. I know it sounds silly, but we're allowed to add this condition. You might not believe it, but what we have described is actually just a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is defined as a vector space equipped with an inner product that is Cauchy complete. Let's break down the math talk. An inner product is essentially a generalized dot product, and we'll discuss this more next episode. Cauchy complete means that every convergent sequence of vectors, like the partial sums of an infinite linear combination, converges to an element inside the vector space. So, put together, a Hilbert space is a vector space equipped with an inner product, where every convergent sum or sequence converges to an element inside our vector space. This is almost word for word what our extra rule was. Really quick, if you want some visual intuition into Cauchy completeness, we can look at our vector space diagram. Remember that in our polynomial vector space, we interpreted the infinite linear combination as a point that lay on the very edge of this space. A Hilbert space is a vector space that also includes this edge. There aren't any gaps that an infinite linear combination can take you to. Hence, in that sense, it is quote-unquote complete. It includes it all. Although this diagram is not mathematically rigorous, I think it gives really good visual intuition. So, hopefully you see that using a Hilbert space makes a lot of sense in quantum mechanics. It's just a way for us to use infinite dimensional vector spaces while making sure we don't get nonsense when we add infinitely many kets together. We want to make sure we always get quantum states at the end of a linear combination, not apple pie. So from now on, we will take our quantum vector space to be a Hilbert space, usually denoted with this fancy looking H. And all of our quantum states live inside of this Hilbert space. Thank you all so much for watching. Next episode, we'll move on to discussing the inner product, which will be arguably the most important tool in all of quantum math. Hope to see you all there.